Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where this week we celebrate two major anniversaries in American history. Obviously, we've got Independence Day coming up this weekend, but seven score and 18 years ago, as of tomorrow, the Gettysburg of Getty, Battle of Gettysburg was, uh, was fought in Southern Pennsylvania. And we want to commemorate that with some of our friends from Pennsylvania. We've got uh, our team from Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum here, which originally was a, uh, a Memorial Hall and Museum for the Civil War. And they're going to take us through some of their collections so we can get up close and personal with real artifacts and personal stories from the Civil War and that uh, per, you know particularly important Battle of Gettysburg. Now, a couple things uh, before I turn it over to, uh, to our team here. One, please keep it interactive. You'll see the chat box to the right of the screen. We're gonna ask you some questions to find out what you know about Gettysburg, what you think about Gettysburg, and we'll put you in the driver's seat to do uh, think about what you would have done in the, the situations that a lot of these soldiers were in during Gettysburg. So answer those questions there. Also, make sure that uh, if you have any questions for our experts here, you drop those in the chat. In the last 10 minutes or so, um, I'm going to interview Michael and Tim, our experts here today, with your questions so we can get you some answers. Also, make sure you've got a camera nearby. In about 35 minutes or so, we're going to give everybody an opportunity to lean in and, and take a photo or a selfie from uh, the site of Gettysburg, uh, you know, through some, some digital magic here. And if you upload that to Instagram and tag us at Varsity Tutors and uh, the team at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall Museum, you'll be entered to win three free months of VT Plus, where you can learn about all kinds of history and other things with Varsity Tutors and a copy of a great book on Gettysburg that we'll showcase a little bit later on in the program. So uh, make sure you've got a camera nearby and uh, actually Tim's showcasing it right now. We don't have to wait for that. Um, so keep it interactive, have a, have a camera nearby. And uh, with all that said, uh, I think it's time to begin. So let me turn it over to Tim and uh, Michael from Soldiers and Sailors. Thanks guys. Thank you, Brian. Great to be here this evening with everybody. So glad you all could join us. My name is Tim Neff. I'm the Vice President and Director of Museum and Education at Soldiers and Sailors. And joining me is? My name is Michael Krauss. I'm the curator and historian here at Soldiers and Sailors. And like Brian said, uh, where this, the timing of this could not be better, tomorrow we'll begin the anniversary of the three-day battle of Gettysburg. And uh, we're going to jump into our presentation now and look at uh, kind of the, the agenda for the day. And we're going to start with just a very brief overview of Gettysburg, just to lay some groundwork about the battle and uh, some significant uh, facts about it. Then we'll move on to look at some of the artifacts that we have in our collection here at the museum uh, that uh, were at the Battle of Gettysburg and have interesting stories behind them and interesting stories about how we learned about how they were at Gettysburg. Uh, from there, we'll jump into the interactive part, where, which is what would you do? And I think is what's great about this section is we've chosen individual battlefield leaders that were at Gettysburg that also have connections to the artifacts that we'll be showing you. So everything is going to be kind of tied together. And then we'll end it all with the uh, little bit, uh, just a little pitch for soldiers and sailors. Well, that's where we are here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, that's what we'll end with um, at the end. So with that, we're gonna jump into the overview of Gettysburg. And we do have a question for you right off the bat here. Number one, have you ever heard of the Battle of Gettysburg? And more importantly, what do you know about the battle? So I'll give you a minute to think about that and type in some of your answers. Maybe think about what was really significant about the battle. Why was it so important? Why are we talking about it so many years later? All right, I'm seeing a lot of people. Most people have heard of the battle. That's good. I kind of expected that. <laughs> and what do you know about the battle? Okay. I'm seeing that it was during the Civil War. And uh, okay, it was a, a Union victory. That's important. Uh, we do know it was a battle in the Civil War, which meant it was the Confederates versus the Union, North versus South, and the Union won the battle, the uh, North won the battle. Uh, it took place on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863. So that's why we said tomorrow is the, the beginning of the anniversary for that. Um, I'm seeing some people call it a turning point of the war, which is very significant and, and a great answer to that question. That is one thing that a lot of people do remember and, and, and the reason why we study it this many years later. And I'm seeing some people pointing out how many casualties there were there. It was the costliest battle of the war. Um, and more men were lost in that three-day battle than any other battle in the entire war. So all of these factors, which you guys really picked up on, and I'm seeing a lot of these good answers, you know, play into, you know, the significance and how important this battle was. Um, up to this point in the war, I think it's safe to say the Union was not doing so well. And uh, uh, 
General Lee uh, from the South decided that he wanted to take the war North and invade the North. And he came into Pennsylvania and um, pretty much by chance, right? They ended up at Gettysburg. Yeah, they, they more or less bumped into each other. They, were, they knew that uh, each other were in the vicinity, but yeah, it was Gettysburg that they ran into each other. Right, and it turned into this three-day, extremely bloody battle um, with the South on the third day, making one last you know, effort to charge through the lines and break through the lines known as Pickett's Charge, one of the most famous events of the, of the battle itself and of the whole entire Civil War. And that's where the South really reached what, you know, is it's called the high water mark of the Confederacy. The farthest they got the North and as far as they did the coming, the breaking through the, the Union line and the, the charge was repelled and the Union went on to win the battle. And like I said, and, and actually you guys said, you know, the battle really turned into a turning point with that big Union victory um, to, to lead to the end of, end of the war, the Civil War, which was an overall Union victory. So for your, all those reasons combined, you know, Gettysburg is, is a significant historical event. We still study it today. We still learn from it today. And a lot of people visit the battlefield, which isn't far from where we are. But I did want to ask everybody, have you ever visited Gettysburg Battlefield in Pennsylvania? It's located uh, right in kind of center, south center Pennsylvania, a little bit towards the east. Uh, it's a beautiful place to visit. Uh, Mike, uh, have, uh, Michael and I have been there, of course, many times. I highly recommend it as a place to go and, and learn this history and walk the, the, the ground that you know, these soldiers walked and fought upon. And it's just also beautiful scenery yeah. and a nice little town. It's got a lot going for it. So how many times do you think you've been to Gettysburg? I know you don't know for sure, but. Uh, hundreds, I thought no, I was, upper I, hundreds. That's what yeah. I was curious. Are we in the hundreds here? You know, I've probably been there 15 times or so, but uh, uh, Michael's uh, spent a lot of time there and, and we highly recommend. And I'm glad to see that coming from some of your answers here, uh, mo uh, some people have been there before, and that's great, and I uh, encourage you to, to visit there. So I just wanted to set the stage there for Gettysburg, its importance, why we're talking about it today. Um, once again, the anniversary coming up in the next three days. And that's going to lead us to our next section here, which is going to look at some of the artifacts that we have in our collection here at Soldiers and Sailors that we know were at the Battle of Gettysburg. And nothing is more important and interesting to learn from an item and to, to even, in our case, get to touch and hold an item that was actually there during the battle. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Michael to start with one of our more amazing stories and the story of discovery about something called the Danner Collection. So, Michael, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. And Tim, you're absolutely right. Like holding, holding an artifact or looking at something that was really there puts a real dimension in, into understanding or just even feeling the moment. And we're lucky enough uh, to, uh, to be a museum that's been around for a long time. We're in our 110th year. Uh, so the, the Civil War veterans were actually here. And a lot of, uh, of our early collection are items that they gave us. So they came directly from them. And we have a number of displays. Um, and over the years, these things have been changed and switched. And unfortunately, sometimes we lose the provenance of, of who gave us a piece or where it came from. And we had one, uh, one showcase that was full of artillery shells. And um, they're all numbered with a white painted number on, on them. And I walked past that display and worked on it for years. And one day, um, I, well, I bought a, a new book, a Gettysburg book, which if you're a historian, you gotta have those books. Yeah. Um, and it was about uh, collecting Gettysburg artifacts. And, there was a small chapter in the back about um, a, a man named Joel Danner, who was uh, a citizen of Gettysburg, who in 1864 opened a shop, the war's still going on. He opened a shop where he sold souvenirs from the battlefield. Now, why did, why did he do that? Because this, this battle was fought in the North and people from the North were coming down. They didn't have to cross enemy lines. Um, they, were, they were looking for uh, where their loved ones fought or fell, or just curious. And sometimes they wanted to take something home. Now they could find something out there, but um, that was sometimes difficult to do. And Danner sold things. But not only did he sell things, but he arranged these little displays in his shop and he had photographs taken of them. And um, a lot, many times he wouldn't just sell the item, but it was more popular to sell a photograph. And what you see here, is a photograph taken probably in the late 1800s of one of Danner's displays. Now, 
uh, this new book that came out had this photograph in it. And I was studying the photograph and I noticed at the top on the right hand side is a canteen and it has the word union painted on it. Dan are often painted uh, places in the, in the battlefield or which side an artifact came from on the actual uh, uh, artifact itself. So it said number seven and union. And I thought, well, that looks really familiar. And I went out, um, I went to work the next day, walked down the hall and hanging on our wall in one of the showcases was uh, canteen number seven, holding it up here, if we can come back to camera. Canteen that says union number seven. And the real clincher was the tear in it right here. It's exactly the same canteen that was in the Danner photograph. And all of a sudden, bells and whistles and lights went on and it was like uh, winning a lottery or a game show. And we started looking at all the pieces we had that had numbers on them, these old white painted numbers. And, and we came to find that we own almost the whole photograph, right? the whole Danner photograph. Yeah, I think we have a close up uh, on the next slide there, a close up of uh, some of the objects that were in there um, that we uh, were able to identify. Uh, if we can see that next slide there. Yeah. Yes, there, there we go. So go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the, the Danner photo is enlarged behind it. And you see on the top is a, a, a cartridge box that says Union Round Top. There had been a number one painted on it. It's been scratched off. Uh, the bugle is the very same bugle on the photograph. Uh, the bayonet is hanging on the left side. And the soldier's hat on the bottom uh, of our photo is the exact same one it's nailed to a board there on the shelf. It even has a nail hole in it yeah. where it was nailed there. And the number 35 is still visible on the brim. So we, we, were, um, we were very excited because now we know that all these pieces that we have actually came from the battlefield of Gettysburg. And they have this connection to the Danner collection, which among collectors today is uh, the, the, like the top shelf identified Gettysburg collectible uh, uh, section of, of Civil War collecting. So I, I just want to point out for some of our viewers here, the, the cartridge box at the top, that was used to carry ammunition. That's where you carried your cartridges. Uh, and Union Round Top. Um, Round Top is one of the locations at uh, Gettysburg. So that would have been, you know, this gentleman Danner labeling his find. Yeah. Where it know, came from. Where, where he found it. Yeah. Um, the bugle, of course, bugles were very important in the war to communicate and give orders on the battlefield and off the battlefield. Um, the bayonet is, is the, the, the sword or knife that goes on the end of your, your rifle. And the hat there, is that a kepi, right? Is yeah, that's a kepi. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's an, it's an odd kepi. Uh, it's probably a union, a union kepi. Uh, kepi is a style of hat. There are forage caps, kepis, chasseur hats, but a kepi is a very low, low crown example. And it's blue, it's probably a, a federal cap. Um, although there are some indications that it, it may be uh, a Confederate cap, but I'm gonna stick with Union. For yes, that. all right. And I think it's um, interesting just to think about this gentleman who lived in Gettysburg, walking out on the battlefield days afterwards and just seeing these things lying all around and, and picking them up. And, and you know, right. now when you go there, of course it's protected, right? Yeah, you, you, know, you can't do that. You yeah. can't do that anymore because it's a, a historical it's site park. it's a national park you know um it's it's protected now but at that time it was a little well he actually free for all <laughs> he actually paid kids to go out on the battlefield and bring yeah. them things so you know pennies but he paid them and then he would sell things in his shop right so he, he was making an industry out of yeah. it right away he's one of the very first you yeah. can go to gettysburg today and there are several um, battlefield relic shops. Mm -hmm. It's a little more expensive than a penny, <laughs> but but they, you can buy authentic pieces from the Civil War in those shops. Right. So if we move on, I think the next slide was that uh, canteen. Now you get a real nice up close look at that Union Number Seven and that rip on there compared to the bottom right. It's exact same, exact same canteen. Yep. And and that was the first kind of aha yeah. moment that led to you know all these other moments. And you mentioned about you know people buying these things, we're not, you know, we haven't confirmed exactly how they got from this shop to soldiers and sailors, right. but we feel pretty good that somebody along the way purchased them from Gettysburg, maybe somebody from Pittsburgh or ties to the, yeah. to the area here. We, we think somebody bought, purchased the entire collection uh, and we have some notes about it coming here in the early twenties. Right. Um, so we're working on to verify 
uh, how that that happened. But uh, these are the right. fragments of information we work with. Right. And this building that we're in opened in 1910. So that was in the very early years of the building. It was probably still, a, um, you know, considered a major landmark, a major new building here in the city of Pittsburgh. And you could see a collector, you know, that there's somebody that bought these, you know, seeing the significance of yeah, donating them and giving, giving, them. Yeah, giving them to this brand new, beautiful landmark and memorial to the, to the soldiers of the Civil War. And then it, this story goes even one little step yeah, deeper yeah. when we start to look at the specific artillery shells. Yeah, yeah there are a number of uh, types of artillery shells included in the collection. Um, there's, uh, there are shankle shells, parrot shells, reed shells, but probably the, the rarest um, shells that we have are on the bottom left. And you see uh, the numbers 19, 21, 34, and 39. And, uh, the, and, and, and then there's the line drawn to the location in the Danner photo. And you notice these shells have a peculiar twist to them. And that's because they're, they can only be fired from one type of a cannon. And that's a Whitworth. And Whitworths were made in England uh, and they were imported for use here by uh, the Southern states, the, the Confederacy. And there was a battery, three cannons at Gettysburg that fired Whitworth shells. Now, the other thing interesting about the Whitworth gun is it loaded from the breech, not from the muzzle. Mm -hmm. So the, the back actually opened up and these shells were put in and they have this severe twist to it, um, which fit perfectly into the riflings. Uh, and, and usually they would prefer to have English made shells because they were made uh, to fit exactly, but they couldn't really get them with the blockade. So the, uh, the manufactories in the South uh, started to produce these shells and they're not made as well as if you could put them side by side, uh, you would be able to easily tell. And we can tell by looking at ours, they're all Confederate uh, manufacturer. And um, they're just so rare. Well, first of all, the gun, because of the peculiar twist in the rifling could fire between one and three miles, the range, which is pretty incredible. Wow. Um, and uh, they weren't really, really, they, I mean, they were in use at Gettysburg. They didn't play uh, they didn't like uh, turn the tide of battle, but they were in use and in play. And we found by looking at our shells, uh, maybe we could look at the next slide. Yeah, I think the next slide shows an even better up close of just the Whitworth. Yep. Yeah, the, the two on the left, um, the number 21 is what's called a bolt. That's a solid piece of iron. The, the number 39 is a shell. I means it's got a hollow cavity in it. And you see at the top, there's a fuse that's kind of halfway unscrewed just to show the fuse. And that's the way it appears in the Danner photograph as well. But there are these two exploded Whitworth shells in the collection. And you're looking at them here. And I want you to notice that they are, uh, the cavity where the powder was is not in the direct center of the shell. And you wouldn't be able to tell this by picking it up, but when it was fired, um, it's heavier on one side because there's more metal. So instead of spinning perfectly, it, 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 it most likely began to wobble and go off course. And people who have looked for Whitworth shells uh, and evidence of, of the guns firing have look, been looking in the range of where they might be and trying to you know, verify. These two shells have explained to many artillery um, aficionados, uh, some friends of mine especially, that this may be why the shells aren't being found in those locations because they spun so far off course and then exploded. Right. I, I could show you one, I have one in my hand here. Here's the uh, very Whitworth shell we were looking at. And you see, this is almost paper thin. The part of the cavity here is almost paper thin. And this is so thick and the shell was intended to spin. If it's spinning, it's just gonna start falling and wobbling and, and not going where it was intended. Right. So this is something we learned because we know these are bona fide Gettysburg Whitworth shells exploded and found on the battlefield. And it, it, it's a revelation. It's another piece to the story of the Battle of Gettysburg. All right, so new information, if you will, which is just fantastic to be able to, you know, as a museum contribute 
you know, new information, especially to these artillery aficionados that, that have studied it and, mm -hmm. and puzzled why they couldn't find these shells. Why, why they weren't effective. Yeah, they right. Why, yeah, where the gun was. Exactly. Why, yeah. yeah, why weren't they even used more often? Well, you know, the, you see that the manufacturing yeah. wasn't going well yeah. and led to disappointing results. And yeah. here's an example there's your, of it. There's your answer right yep. there. So that was a, a really exciting for us and, and one of those just discoveries that Michael made that you know reverberated through our whole collection and, and our whole staff and, and we learned so much from. That being said, it's not all we have from Gettysburg. Oh, no. We have yeah. uh, even more and, and that's gonna bring us to our next kind of little segment here about Major General Governor K. Warren and the collection that we have from him. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Mike to tell you about sure. him and, and the stuff that we have. Um, Governor. Major General Governor K. Warren. It's a funny first name. It's mm -hmm. actually, um, is it, I think it's Dutch. No, it's, uh, I can't remember what it is. I will in a second. Um, uh, he was a major major figure in the Battle of Gettysburg. He, he had been the Colonel of the 5th New York Zouaves and then was promoted to be uh, the Chief of the Engineer Corps, Topographical Engineers. He was a brilliant man, a West Point graduate. And at the Battle of Gettysburg, he was reconnoitering. That means he's looking around the battlefield. He's operating uh, for uh, the staff for General Meade. And he made his way to a hill um, called uh, Little Round Top. And once he got there, he noticed something. And I'm going to let Tim talk about that later. Yeah, keep, that, talk, uh, yeah, keep, yeah, that, keep in mind. that in mind. That'll play into the, the roles, uh, the decision making later on. So we don't want to go too deep into right. it. I just uh, want to talk about the sword yep. itself. And this is a piece that came to us not that long ago. We, we hold uh, events here at Soldiers and Sailors. And at one of them, uh, a very nice woman walked up to me and asked if I knew who Governor Warren was. And I said, of course, I know who he, who he was. And she said, well, my sister is married to his uh, great, great grandson and they have his sword under the bed. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, of course, uh, opened my eyes and ears and we became fast friends and uh, through a series of discussions of conversations. I was introduced to her sister and the family has uh, uh, given us this sword plus some other artifacts that belong to Warren. So it, we're, you know, it's a major piece from a major figure at the Battle of Gettysburg that's in our collection. Yeah, and I think if you go to the next slide, you'll see just a couple of the other items that were associated with, uh, with Warren. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about him more later and realize how important he was to the battle. Um, that's his statue at Gettysburg there in that photo next to the telescope and um, a horse, horse spur. And that other item there is a map making tool. Yeah, dividers for measuring distances. on. on right. That. So when Mike mentioned the topographical mm -hmm. as engineering, that's where that plays a role as, as making maps. Yeah, you, you notice the man on the bottom on the left looking through a telescope. That's Governor Warren. Mm -hmm. And that most likely is the telescope that we have. Right. So another chance encounter, uh, yeah. now a more modern chance encounter in this case, but that led to these wonderful artifacts finding a home here and now they are prominently displayed in our Gettysburg room. We actually have a room in this building that from the beginning was called the Gettysburg room and we have some of these items on display in there. So we'll move on to the next one here and the next one is a couple flags that we have and once again I'll turn it over to Michael. This is an amazing flag here. I don't want to steal too much here but those holes on there are, are telling a story, well, aren't they? Either they're big moths, <laughs> which they are not. No, uh, they're actually bullet holes. This flag is a is a uh, a marker for uh, for a brigade commander. Uh, you notice it has like a knight's cross in it, almost like a German cross. Some people ask us, well, why do you have a German cross on this flag? Uh, well, before it, it was appropriated. Um, it was used in many places all over the world in, in different kinds of art. But during our Civil War, uh, we the Army of the Potomac was arranged in different corps, First Corps, Second Corps, Third Corps, etc. cetera. And uh, they needed to, um, they figured they needed to, to designate a, a symbol to, uh, uh, so, that, so that each corps could be represented and use that symbol uh, on its uh, insignia. And this is uh, the, the Maltese cross is the insignia of the fifth army corps. The, uh, the fact that it's red means it's the first division and the blue bar on it uh, translates to third brigade. So this is a coded signal of what this flag means. And it would have been carried near uh, the command position or the commander. And that would have been Colonel Jacob Schweitzer. And um, 
This flag was present, we know. It was given to us in 1921. Uh, we have a very nice old note that the flag was carried at the Battle of Gettysburg and the Battle of Wilderness. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll have a little more yeah, about the Another flags. one, yeah. which we'll talk about a little bit later on and, and Jacob Schweitzer himself and, and some of the decisions he had to make. But uh, yeah, those holes on there are, are bullet holes and uh, it is supposed to be a pennant shaped. Yes, uh, it that's would come, the core pennant. Yeah, yeah, it would come to a point there at yeah. the end. It looks a little, it might look distorted, but that's actually how it is. Right. It, it should come to a point there. And we've studied it uh, to the fact um, you could actually forensically, forensically look at some of those holes and you can determine that they're 58 caliber, 69 caliber, right. 31 caliber. Some of them go through it sideways, uh, but it's just fascinating to think that this was uh, you know, struck by bullets and, and look how many of them were in the air right. uh, between those two battles. Yep. So we will get back to him and his story a little bit later on, but we have one other flag that we wanted to show and that's a, uh, what we would call a signal flag uh, you may remember in the beginning of the class, I mentioned how uh, bugles were used to communicate. Well, another way to communicate was through signal flags. And uh, this is a pretty unique one that was at Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this, uh, there, there would be a pair of these. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of a pair. The second flag would be red with a white square in the center. And they were um, carried by members of the signal corps. And these were men who um, were sent to various positions and by using the two flags, could, uh, there, there was a binary uh, system, you know, where one flag is dipped and raised, dipped twice, or, or, uh, or, or both of them were dipped. And that corresponded to um, a, a prediscerned code. They weren't really using a Morse code because the enemy could read that, but it was, they were numbers. And then that, that was translated into a secret code book that um, the command people could look at. And we have this one flag that descended through a family whose um, ancestor was a Signal Corps person who was stationed on Big Round Top at, mm -hmm. at, uh, at Gettysburg. And Big Round Top was the site of the Union Signal Station. They, they needed somewhere that was high enough that these flags could be seen by the next signal station, which might have been a mile or away or, or so, uh, so that that message could keep being repeated till it got to headquarters. So you notice a little brown note on there and that, that explains um, uh, who the donor was, uh, the owner and um, wh where he was in Big Round Top. And we also know because uh, his diary exists, we don't own it, but he talks about being on Big Round Top uh, and what he did there. Mm -hmm. And that little note came with the flag. It's, yeah, it's tied onto the flag. And that ties into a, a word that uh, Mike, uh, Michael used earlier, the provenance behind an item. Um, that's a big museum word that uh, is used a lot in our field. But just to be clear, that's essentially the story behind the object and how, you know. It's the, the ownership yeah, change. Yeah, the ownership change. change and, and the story. Right. To, it's used to basically authenticate the item to make sure it's the real thing. And, and um, you know, if, you, if an item doesn't have the provenance, it can be yeah. very frustrating yeah. because you can't prove anything. Yeah. You can't document anything. And that's why, you know, when it comes to museums, they're always looking for as much provenance as possible. And that's kind of what we're talking about with each one of these items and how we've, how we've learned about them. So the next one we have is actually a painting. And this is a, a painting that hang as probably hung in our building yeah. since the beginning, but it, it, has. Uh, yeah. it still hangs today. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's over the Valley of Death and it's depicting Farnsworth's charge. Um, so you want to tell us a little bit about the painting itself? Sure. Uh, the man in the center who is uh, absorbing enemy fire, <laughs> in a kind way to yeah. say that, um, is, a, is a man named Elon Farnsworth, and he was a brigadier general at the Battle of Gettysburg, and he led a charge on the 3rd of July, which we'll talk about in a little while, but um, this painting depicts that charge. The charge was made over very rough ground, fences, um, rocks. It, it was not an ideal place to uh, lead a cavalry charge. I can tell you two things about the painting uh, because we have the artist's notes. The, in the artist, uh, the painting was given to us in 1911. So it's been here since the building, one year after the building opened. The man on the right in the white coat, you might say, why is a Union soldier wearing a white coat? Um, his name was Captain Cushman and he was on Farnsworth's staff. And uh, a young woman had made him a, a coat out of white duck. It's like a canvas. 
with gold braid on it. And she told him that uh, he, he would not be harmed if he wore this coat. And when he put it on, you know, he was advised not to wear it. And he said, no, no, I'll be bulletproof. And uh, I'm not, not afraid. And unfortunately, it did not uh, prevent his death. He was killed there. And then you notice on the left-hand side, there's a cavalry trooper charging uh, without a uniform. He's just in a shirt uh, with no hat and a sword. And um, the artist had, uh, he, he was not a veteran, but he talked to a lot of veterans. And he uh, talked to one cavalry soldier that told him that, uh, that this cavalry soldier himself had always ridden into battle without his jacket and without his cap because it got in his way. Mm. So he decided to uh, put that element, it's an authentic element, yeah. um, into the painting. Yeah. So it's just a wonderful, you know, just action. And of course, you know, photography was around in the Civil War, mm -hmm. kind of in its infant stages. And you'll see f photographs of, you know, Civil War battlefields, but most of that is all after the battle posing situations. Um, but this was the only way to truly capture it. And, and that's fascinating that the uh, painter took the time to learn so much about mm -hmm. that, this particular situation. He didn't just go at this and make it up as he went along. He, he actually, you know, learned from first -hand, account, first hand accounts, mm -hmm. you know, how to make it as accurate as possible. And it's yeah. uh, a wonderful painting that still hangs, as I said, in our building today. And we're going to move on to, uh, I think, a document that we have called Compensation for Loss. And um, this is a very unique piece that I think is a, not often thought about when it comes to, to you know, these, these battles that, you know, these, as we said in the beginning of the class, this just happened in Gettysburg. They just kind of bumped into yeah. each other and uh, it wasn't planned. So, you know, people of Gettysburg were completely caught off guard and were not ready for this. And there's stories of civilians that were in danger and some civilians that lost their life. Yeah, you know, Jenny Wade comes to mind right away. But this document speaks a little bit to that. So if you could tell us a little about that. Yeah, and, and again, remember, this is a battle that's fought in the north in Pennsylvania. So in Pennsylvania is a, is a rich farmland. In fact, uh, many Confederate soldiers commented that they'd never seen such bounty. You know, giant barns and fields of wheat and apple orchards. You know, they're just astounded by how, how fertile this area of Pennsylvania was. And, and, and then you, in, in the South, over the fighting over three years, had decimated the resources of the South of woods, trees, firewood, crops. Um, you know, it was a, an ecological disaster. But here we are in the North, and here comes this major battle with, uh, you know, almost 200,000 participants in it. And uh, it's going to make a mark. It's going to not only on, on horses and people, but on the land itself. And many of the farmers, this is the peak of summer, July, 1863, they have crops in the field and the crops are, are gonna be destroyed. A lot of them are just gonna be destroyed by men charging through them, animals, cannons, whatever you can think of uh, would destroy the crops. And, and when, they, when the armies parted, uh, many of the farmers came back to find um, their farms in ruin. And they uh, commissioned, they petitioned the government of Pennsylvania for damages to farms, and that um, it was it was thought that uh, it was decided that only damages done by um, the uh, uh, Union Army would be compensated. Um, Confederate, if the Confederate Army did it, they they figured it was an act of war. So there were some conditions, and and many of the uh, many of the uh, compensations were not granted. But here we have one uh, to a man named uh, Lewis uh, Eister. He was in Butler Township, Adams County, and he received compensation of $335.84 for his crops, for the loss of two cows in farm equipment. Wow. And it's signed by uh, uh, John Geary, who was uh, uh, later the governor of Pennsylvania on the bottom. Yeah. So that just the aftermath of war and the the, 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 you know, how much it decimates everything around it. And uh, of course, most of the Civil War took place in the South, uh, most of the large battles, and this was not a consideration at all down there. Um, but in this case, since it was Pennsylvania, and, and, and if it was, you know, could be documented, Union, the Union caused it, they were compensated. And this is an example of, a, of one of those documents. And then we have one more here, which is a photograph in our collection and it's a photograph of somebody, if you're a Gettysburg historian and, and somebody who knows the battle, you know this name for sure. 
And uh, as far as we know, this is unpublished, right? So, yes. which makes it very unique. So I'll yeah. let you talk a little bit about that. Well, uh, for, for people who know Gettysburg, who have been there, you may recognize the monument in the background. That's the Pennsylvania monument. And that monument has on the panels, the names of every Pennsylvania soldier who fought in the Battle of Gettysburg. So it's pretty fascinating. And people uh, go there to look up, uh, look at their family's name and find uh, ancestors who were there. Uh, but this picture was taken um, in the spring of 1913. Uh, before, in 1913 was the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. So there, was, there were plans for a huge encampment from the Grand Army of the Republic and the United Confederate Veterans. First time both groups would actually be in the same place. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some, some things that happen. We won't talk about that. Yeah. But um, uh, so there was, you know, there was a lot of, uh, let, let, you know, and it's in any convention, people came early to stake out the place and get the agenda together. And this picture was taken uh, during one of those uh, sessions. And the man on the right, uh, who looks like Colonel Sanders, or looks like me, actually, <laughs> is a man named uh, Charles McKenna. And he was a soldier in the 155th Pennsylvania. Uh, and he was on the committee, the, the 50th anniversary committee. It's the man on the left who uh, we're paying attention to, and that is Joshua Chamberlain. He was the colonel of the 20th Maine that uh, played a significant role at a battle on Little Round Top, which Tim will talk about in a little bit. And uh, Chamberlain visited in May of 1863, uh, and he became ill after that and was not able to attend the uh, reunion. So this uh, is the last time he visited the battlefield of Gettysburg. I don't know whether this is the last photograph of him there, but it's, it's the event, the last time that he was at the battlefield of Gettysburg. Right. And like we said, if you know the battle, you've probably heard of Chamberlain. Uh, that's what makes this photo so significant. It's yeah. nobody else has seen it unless you've come to our museum. Um, and uh, we'll talk about him a little bit more and, and kind of even more so how he became even more famous with the movie Gettysburg. We'll, sure. we'll mention that. And Michael has some ties to that movie mm -hmm. as well. But I think it's time now we want to jump into a, the next section of the class. And we're going to move on to what would you do? So we've taken some of these individuals that we've already learned a little bit about and created situations that mirror what they were faced with in the Battle of Gettysburg during the battle. And uh, we're going to ask you to decide what would be the best decision. And sometimes they made the decision that you may think is the best decision. Sometimes they didn't. Um, but we'll, we'll, of course, answer which one was the actual decision that they made. But this is for you to more critically think about what you would do in this situation, putting yourself in their shoes. And the first one is Major General Governor K. Warren. We learned about him and, um, you know, we saw some of his items that are in our collection here. And in this case here, Warren, um, who was in the 5th New York Infantry Regiment, as we mentioned, and he was a topographical, you know, working on maps and, and looking at the ground. And he notices that the federal left flank is exposed and could be exploited by the enemy, which means he, opened, he knows that the left end of the line, the very end of the line is in trouble. And that's bad news. When the end of your line's in trouble, that can lead to the whole line crumbling right down. So he knows something has to happen. So he has to make a tough decision and then decide what, what the next step will be. Does he, or would you even, take your chances that the left flank will hold its position? Pretty risky, but it might happen. B, direct troops to occupy the high ground on the left flank. All right, makes sense. High ground usually sounds pretty good. Or C, order retreat from the left flank to find a better position. Sometimes you see the word retreat and just automatically think that's a bad idea, but sometimes there's a strategic retreat where you can make a decision that, that just finds a better spot that defend where you are um, to more effectively keep that flank protected. So think about what you would do in this situation. I'll give you a minute. I'm seeing a lot of answers already coming through. And I do see a lot of the majority of the answers are the, the answer that he chose in this case. And that would be letter Letter B, right. Okay, B. so he did, He decided to occupy the high ground, which if you were listening earlier, you, you might have you might have heard uh, Mike say little round top. That was a hill that uh, he decided we needed to get troops up there to keep the flank protected. And uh, if you visit uh, Gettysburg today, it's one of the most popular places to visit. It's, uh, uh, like I said, a, a hillside with monuments on top. And one of the most prominent monuments is 
Good Governor one. Warren. And that's a tribute to him recognizing how important that site would be mm -hmm. um, to, to keeping this, the, 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 and this is on the second day of the battle and to keeping that line intact. And uh, he is known in, in many cases as the hero of Little Round Top for that reason, for identifying that. Um, so that's what Warren did. I, I, I don't know if everybody, not everybody decided on that one, but most of you did. And, and the high ground is oftentimes a, a good idea during a battle to try to, to occupy that. So let's move on to the next one. And the next one's gonna be Colonel Jacob Schweitzer. If you remember, he had the flag, we know it was riddled with bullet holes. So he was seeing some very heavy fighting. Once again, this is the second day of the battle. And this is in an area called the wheat field, which if you're once again, familiar with Gettysburg, you just know right away what that means that this is some very heavy fighting on the second day. And his situation is he's been engaged in heavy fighting and ordered to withdraw by his commanding officer. Seeking reinforcements, a different high-ranking officer asks for his support. What would you do in this situation? So basically you've already you know, withdrawn, but another commanding officer, not your direct commanding officer, comes up and says, I need help, you need to help me now. What, and what would you do here? And you'll see the options here. Letter A, do you explain that you're willing to help, but will only take orders from your commanding officer. B, completely ignore the request and just not even, you know, just say no completely, or C, fulfill the request and provide immediate reinforcements for the officer that could help hold the position. So this that's one's a tough one. Yeah, that's a tough yeah. one. Uh, I, I'd be there interested to see, and I'm seeing a lot of different answers, much more variety on this yeah. one than the first one yeah. I'm seeing come through here. All right. This is the, and the scene of intense fighting. Yes. Yeah, and there's a and, and he, there's withdrawals and there's going back in and back, back and, and forth, forth and back and forth. Both sides are pushing on one another. And in this case, Jacob Schweitzer decides letter A to explain that although he was willing to help, he will only take orders from his commanding officer. Mm -hmm. What he's doing though is risking, you know, delaying, you know, that, that maybe if he helped right away and it provided that immediate reinforcement, maybe that the, the would have been a different outcome. Yeah. But he, you know, as a military officer, and of course, anybody within the military, or if you know somebody, you know, you, you know who you take orders from, and that's all you take orders from. And that's the, the line that he decided to follow. And he held back. And uh, that was the, the, the path that he chose. And that's actually related to our next story, which is uh, Corporal Jacob Funk. Now, we did not have an artifact directly related to him, but he was serving with uh, Schweitzer. Uh, in that same group in the 62nd Pennsylvania Infantry Regiment. And uh, he's um, just a, more of a regular soldier. The first two guys are high ranking decision makers. Yeah. This is more of a, just a regular soldier who just happens to be the color bearer, the guy that carries the flag. He did not carry the flag we showed you earlier. It would have been a different flag, but he is wounded and he's a wounded color bearer. And he's headed for the rear for medical attention with the flag. All of a sudden you are confronted by a Confederate prisoner who has picked up a gun. What would you do? So now you're in a situation where it's complete chaos. Chaos. A man that was a prisoner is now in let go because there's nobody left to guard him. And he's picked up a gun and he's confronted you with your flag. What do you do? Do you letter A, surrender the flag? Do you letter B, try to run and save the flag? Or letter C, do you create a distraction and try to get away with the flag? Yeah, again, tough decision. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, you know, yeah. and this guy's got a gun pointed right at you. Um, he could take your life at any moment. But at the same time, mm -hmm. we haven't talked about this as much, uh, but flags were so important as symbols on the battlefield. They were to be protected at all costs. Um, the last thing you wanted to do was let the enemy capture your flag. Um, when I talk about this for a lot of my classes, I ask young people to think about the game capture the flag. Yeah. And of course, you know, that was some of the Civil War was they wanted to get their hands on the flag. So the question becomes, which one did he do? And what, and what would you do? All right, I see a lot of different answers here. And in this case, what he does is he creates a distraction and he tries to get away with the flag. Yeah. All right. And you might say, well, what kind of distraction could he make? Well, he was he kind of took advantage of this chaotic situation and he just shouted out, you know, you know, 
you know, shoot this man. Hey, you know? guys, get him. Yeah, yeah. get him. You yeah. know, this guy's yeah. aiming a gun at me. And there was nobody there. Yeah, he's talking to nobody, yeah. Yeah. but it was just enough to take the Confederate soldier's attention away that he was able to, to, to get on the move with the flag, cut, make some distance between him. He still gets wounded. He gets shot, but he gets far enough away with the flag to pass the flag along and keep it from getting uh, completely captured and keep it safe. And he goes back and gets his medical attention. So that's a split second decision. Yeah. Guy's got a gun at you, and you very easily could have just dropped it and, and yeah, you know, that, begged for you your can't life. Train for no, yeah. no, it just happened. Yeah, but he in that instant yeah. came up with this idea to just kind of yell out that distraction, say, "Hey, shoot this guy! He's going to shoot me!" And there was really nobody there, so he got away with it. Okay, our next one. So this is related to the painting that we saw, Captain Elon Farnsworth. And he is, this is now the third day of the battle, all right? So now we're uh, uh, at the third day. I had mentioned Pickett's charge earlier. That was the last kind of gasp effort of the Confederacy. So now we're even after the collapse of Pickett's charge, you are ordered to make a charge against the Confederate infantry. What would you do? So this is kind of really late in the battle. You know, it, it's just uh, over tough ground. We saw in the painting that it was very uneven ground. And his options are, does he lead the risky uh, charge, no questions asked? Or does he protest the orders, but lead the charge anyway? Or does he disobey a direct order and risk the consequences of not following that order? So I think it's pretty clear. He does know this is not a great idea. Yeah. Uh, I think he knows that it's, it's a very um, futile situation, but what would you do in this situation? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of different answers here. Let's see in a few that are disobeying the direct order, which would certainly in your in your mind make sense because it's life, yeah, save right. your life and save the life lives mm -hmm. of your men. But as a military officer, once again, he knew what he was had to do, and after protesting the orders, letter B, he led the charge anyway, mm -hmm. and uh, ends up as we basically saw in the painting yeah. being killed as a part of the charge. The yeah, chest. yeah, shot yeah. five times yeah. in the chest. So there's a situation where he knew it was the wrong decision. It wasn't even necessary to the battle. No, the battle would, for all intents and purposes was over. Right, yeah. so, so this was all for nothing. And uh, that commanding officer was Brigadier General Kilpatrick. And um, I, I tried to learn a little bit more than anything ever happened to him. And it was kind of yeah. like he, no. people knew it was the wrong decision but nothing ever really significantly happened right. to him. He basically, um, he said that, uh, he called he, he called Farnsworth a coward if he wouldn't do it. Right. That's and Farnsworth got really upset and said, "Okay, I'll do it, but the consequences are on you." Right. And um, after Farnsworth's death, death, Kilpatrick wrote a kind of flowery letter extolling the virtues of the right. brave. The he was bravery. a brigadier general. Uh, Farnsworth was a brigadier general at mm -hmm. the time. Okay. Uh, extolling his virtue um, and praising him all the time, knowing that he sent him to his death. Right. Yeah. And then we have one more. And once again, this is related to the photo we saw at the end of Colonel Joshua Chamberlain. We mentioned him a lot earlier and um, he uh, was uh, prominent in, at Little Round Top and he is at Little Round Top. Okay, so now this is later on. They've, they've after Warren's identified mm -hmm. it, now they're trying to hold that position. He's at the left flank. Once again, that left flank comes up of the Union line. He's running out of ammunition. What would you do? In other words, the Confederates keep coming up after him over and over again, up this little hillside, and he's repelling them, but he's running low on ammunition, and he doesn't know what to do, and he, and we'll see the options here, and we'll see what you would do. Would you, letter A, fall back and save the lives of your men? Would you, letter B, hold the position and use all your ammunition until hand-to-hand -hand combat ensues? Or, letter C, would you order a risky bayonet charge down the hill, giving up your position? Now, once again, if you've seen the movie Gettysburg or you know Gettysburg, the battle pretty well, you probably know this right away. But, and I am seeing that come through in a lot of answers, which is great. And a lot of you have that correct choice, which is order the risky bayonet charge down the hill, giving up your position. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's such a difficult thing to do. I mean, cool. you know, this is going to be you know, just charge with your bayonet at the end of your rifle down the hill and you have no idea what's the consequence. It was so unexpected mm -hmm. and, and it was so full of momentum 
And let's face it, the Confederates who they had been attacking that position right. several times, they were tired. They were pretty uh, weary, worn sure. Out. Their mm -hmm. ammunition was low. But to see these men charging at them with bayonets, mm -hmm. uh, the ones who didn't run away surrendered. Right. And it was the end of that part of the fight. And the left of the line was secured. Yeah. So once again, a, a decision made in that split second, what do you do? And uh, he came up with an idea completely yeah. outside of the box. And for that reason, you know, has... Uh, garnered so much attention for years and years. Uh, I keep mentioning the movie of Gettysburg and he's highlighted very much so in that movie with that bayonet charge. And Michael, you know a little bit about that movie, don't you? I do. I was a consultant for that movie and I was there for a long time, <laughs> uh, which was great. And, um, you know, at the time, not realizing what an impact it would have. Um, although, you know, living through it, it was certainly a uh, a great experience to, to be involved with. And I highly recommend the movie. It's, it's uh, really well done and, and fascinating to, to watch Gettysburg come to life uh, in that movie. Okay, so that's gonna bring us to the last section, which is just a quick plug for soldiers and sailors. Um, where we are here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, there's our beautiful building in the early years at the top of that photo there. That's actually a book that we have that we uh, did called Witness the History Gettysburg Tales the Artifacts Tell. And uh, that's where we took a lot of these stories that we told you today, plus more. I mean, we, you know, I don't want to say tip of the iceberg, but there's still plenty, of, yeah. plenty yeah. other stories that are covered in this book that are, that are artifacts that we have in our collection. And the book is loaded with beautiful photographs of each of the artifacts, plus the story behind them. And as we mentioned at the beginning, if you, you know, do your photo at the end here and tag the right things. You're entered in, a, in a, a, comp, a, a drawing to win this, a copy of this book here. And also I wanna mention, I know this might be a long shot, but if you're in the Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania area, here at the end of the summer from August 9th to August 13th, we run a summer camp uh, all about the, the Civil War. And we spend a week just learning about the war and, and you know, uh, meeting reenactors. In fact, we'll meet Abe Lincoln that week and, you know, we'll taste food from the time period. It's just a great experience. If you have any young historians in the, in the even in the Western Pennsylvania region, it's something you don't mm -hmm. want to miss. It's a, a great, great chance to really dive in and learn all about the Civil War. I would have loved to have gone to that <laughs> camp. <laughs> so that's going to bring us to the end here. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Brian to talk about the, uh, I don't know if we're doing the photo or the questions next. Whatever, whatever you got, Brian. All of the above, guys. So we'll uh, we'll get that ready. Make sure you guys have your cameras ready. And a huge thanks um, to uh, to Michael and Tim for a ton of amazing information and getting up close and personal with those artifacts and really making the the you know Civil War and the Battle of Gettysburg come alive. Um, here's your chance to uh, to win a copy of that book, which I'm going to ask when we get to your questions, uh, just personal questions. Is that available for sale? Because I don't think I'm allowed to win, but uh, I definitely after today want to check that out. If you got those cameras ready, you'll have a chance to win that book and and three free months of ET Plus where you can learn about history, art, science, all kinds of things, anything you would want to learn about with Varsity Tutors. There's a link on your screen if, uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about it or enroll just in case you don't win. Um, but with that said, we want to give everybody an opportunity to, uh, to take a, a battlefield photo at Gettysburg. Hopefully you have the opportunity to visit someday, but if, uh, if that's not in the cards for, uh, for this summer, you should still be able to get a, a souvenir photo here. So we're going to go full screen on an amazing picture of the battlefield here so you guys can get those pictures if you put those up on instagram you'll be entered to win but uh let's get that up here and uh we'll let you guys get some uh, some gettysburg selfies All right. Hopefully you guys got some great pictures there. Uh, if you didn't get the exact battlefield uh, picture that you guys want, we'll, uh, we'll make sure you get to, uh, to get a picture with, uh, with our experts here in just a second as they're back for some, uh, some questions and answers. And I know we went a little bit over time, but it was totally worth it um, to get a feel for, uh, for what, what would you do? I always love uh, kind of getting everyone in the position of, you know, these were real decisions made by real people um, with real consequences. And so, uh, so huge thanks for that. Um, 
couple of the, the questions that came up that I thought were, uh, were really exciting. One was about the artifacts. I think we saw from the Danner collection, a lot of these were sold. Do you guys have a, a feel for how many artifacts uh, from the Civil War are privately owned versus mechanical percentages versus available in museums? Um, do you guys have your eye on anything that, that's out there that you don't have that you would want to have? And, and are there still chances for, you know, maybe the stuff that veered off into the woods with, uh, with misshapen uh, mortar shells for, uh, for civilian civilians like us to, to ever be able to discover something like that? Well, there's a lot of answers to that question because there's a lot of parts to it. Uh, but there is a, there's a huge uh, network of collectors that collect Civil War material. And um, there are uh, like uh, conventions and shows that uh, sell only Civil War stuff. There was one in Gettysburg this past weekend. There was a Civil War show that had Civil War relics. And there are numbers of uh, businesses around the country, shops in the north and south that are dedicated to selling Civil War stuff. Um, uh, things still pop up at flea markets, auctions, stuff still comes out of the ground. People are using, uh, you know, very sophisticated metal detectors in places and looking for things that come out of the ground. Uh, we are, I'm always uh, amazed at, at the contacts we get. Uh, about two months ago, somebody, um, got in touch with us and they had a Civil War cavalry jacket that they wanted to give us, which we took. <laughs> but it, I'm just amazed that the things are still in families and that's good, you know, um, but what we get, and especially that jacket, there was nobody left in the line of succession. So they wanted to make sure it went somewhere that uh, could appreciate it. Uh, so there is a lot of stuff out there. And, and a caveat, there's a lot of uh, fake stuff too. So uh, if you're going to buy something, be very, very, very careful. And I do want to point out that if you found one of those shells that veered off on a battlefield, that doesn't mean you get to keep it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as we mentioned, a lot of that is protected uh, uh, these days and, and for good reason, so that things don't just get out there and on the market like that. But uh, we'll imagine a battlefield with potholes all through it that people have dug. Yeah. And, um, and they, the places should be protected. So, um, you can sometimes dig on private land if you're if you have permission. Uh, no, that's a really good point. It's it's for the good of the preservation of yeah. you know the battlefield for historical purposes. It's final resting place for so many uh, you know people, and and so it's you know it's good to not be uh, yeah. just going around casually digging to hope to find yeah. something. So. Great point. Hey, one other one that came up a lot during, uh, you know, what would you do is, can you tell us a little bit more about the importance of, uh, of the flag? Was there a tactical significance? Was it more a, a matter of pride type thing of, uh, of the standard? What, were, what would have been some of the consequences of letting that flag fall into enemy hands? Well, that's a little bit of everything you just said. Yeah, there. yeah right. it was it was a tactical because it was your symbol on the battlefield. It was another way to communicate so that, you know, as Mike really described that one flag and all the different things that it told you, what division it was, what brigade it was, um, you know, that all came out through that flag. So a commanding officer can see that flag and know exactly where those troops are. So you know, that's the kind of tactical importance. But then there was certainly, you know, the, the rally, you know, the rally around the flag feeling of how important that symbol was uh, to the well, regiment or to that group. Yeah, each regiment carried its own flags. Mm -hmm. So in a regiment is a is a body of men about, it should be a thousand, but many times through battle and it's about 300 or 400 men. So they, each regiment carried a stand of colors that delineated that regiment. And those were sacred to, the, to them. First of all, it was a place where they lined up in the morning. When they moved out and fought in battle, the flags were in the center of the regiment. They aligned on them and they were presented um, from the governor or from people at home. So they did not want to lose that flag under any circumstance. And the color bearers were huge targets. If you picture a six foot by six foot flag in the air in the middle of a regiment mm -hmm. and it gets taken down and the regiment gets um, you know, disoriented until somebody else picks it up and they, they take their place. So it's a dangerous place to be carrying a flag in this, the scene of much gallantry to be associated with the colors in a regiment. And just to add on to the pride of the flag, and I know in Pennsylvania, I believe you told me this, uh, or I read this, that 
you know, a lot of those regimental flags, they wanted to replace them, mm -hmm. but the regiments didn't want them replaced because they were such sources of pride. Yeah. The bullet holes, the tears that showed that they had been yeah. battle worn and had seen all this action. And yeah. they, you know, that just was a, a signified the pride that they had as a group together. Yeah, some flags were literally just red stripes in a parts of a blue field <laughs> right. and, and the uh, states wanted them turned in so that they could give them new ones. And like Tim said, they, they wanted to be a veteran regiment, not identified as a new regiment. Right. Uh, well, and that, that kind of gets the Star Spangled Banner is basically that yeah. too, right? A flag that's seen everything, but is still yeah. standing. That's kind right. of, you know, we rally around that all the time now. Hey, last question for you. Um, and, and thank you guys for uh, for so much great insight and, and everybody out there for some amazing questions. Um, it's always kind of a bummer to have to cut it at, at some point, but I want to be conscious of everybody's time on that. But it's not a school night because it's summer vacation. It's uh, it's a work night for uh, for parents and uh, folks at home. Um, can you tell us a little bit? We know Gettysburg was was pivotal toward, toward you know, turning the tide of the war. Um, can you tell us a little bit about and how should we just think of the consequences of, of Gettysburg? Why was it such a turning point and kind of what, what unfolded, you know, uh, sort of immediately thereafter in the, you know, the next couple of months thereafter that sort of led toward still, you know, almost two years until the conclusion of the war. But can you help give us some context on why Gettysburg was so pivotal, pivotal and, and what happened next? Well, uh, Tim had mentioned that the, high, the term high water mark and then the fact that uh, the Confederate army was up north in Pennsylvania and the high water mark also symbolized the, the, the peak of strength of the, of the army of Northern Virginia. That was the army that was here. Uh, and and it, was, uh, it was pretty badly shot up and, and uh, had to re reconsolidate, reconfigure itself. It had to escape out of Pennsylvania uh, and lick its wounds. Um, and Lee was masterful at, at, at getting out of there uh, without the whole federal army following him. But it took, um, it took the rest of the summer to, to put things back together again, to get his army consolidated, to resupply, restock. And they never, never were at the strength um, that they were at Gettysburg. And every time they lost a man, a cannon, a horse, it was just at, from that point on, it was very difficult for the South to replace those resources. In the North, you know, uh, it was a, the sleeping giant had awoken. Our industry was pumping war material. We had plenty of troops. We were, we, we were drafting men. Um, our army was growing and growing and, and, and becoming more practiced in the skill of war, which they hadn't been earlier, which is why they suffered so many defeats. Our leaders be, were better. The Confederate leaders couldn't be replaced. So it's just, it's kind of the beginning of the end. And certainly the South had some memorable victories afterwards, but it was just, it was just uh, very difficult to keep up with the resources of the North. And I think the movie Gettysburg does a good job of looking at Lee and that decision he had to make, you know, of Pickett's charge. Yeah. It was kind of futile. I think you know, a lot of people didn't know, but he was, he knew that this was their chance. Like, yeah. he, like Mike said, this was them at their full strength. They break through that line. They go on to Washington, DC. That's their chance. Yeah. And once that chance is taken away and they're repelled, it, it's a matter of time at that point. And it worked for him before. Yeah. There were right. times we worked for him. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Really good insight. And, um, and thank you for, I know, uh, you know, we talked a little bit before, uh, you know, putting the class here, like, hey, it's a 4th of July week. People really want to be thinking about Independence Day, but it's, uh, you know, every year around this time, it is a big reminder of the most pivotal battle of the Civil War and, uh, you know, great, uh, great anniversary to commemorate. So um, thank you guys so much for some amazing insight and uh, for sharing the, uh, the treasures of the vault with us. Uh, yeah, you know, for anyone who has a chance, you guys are open now, right? So anybody who wants to come see those in person, yeah. Um, if you're around Pittsburgh or can get there, you can go check those out. Um, definitely get those pictures up on Instagram. We'll have the uh, official uh, handles up here in just a second. So you can enter to win that book. If, uh, if you don't, that was my other question. You can buy yeah. that online. Right? Thanks for getting back to it. If you yeah. don't win the book, you can go to our website and look up our contact information. We can certainly uh, sell these uh, you know, via the mail. I don't think our gift shop's completely online yet, but we can still, you know, sell these if you're interested. So just go to our contact page. You can contact Michael or me directly and we'll take care of it. And uh, you can purchase these books if you don't, aren't one of the lucky ones that, that wins. So um, we'd love to, love to see some people uh, learn more about our collection.
Excellent. Well, I, I'm sure you'll get some contact uh, definitely for me and, and probably for some others. Thank you guys. Thanks to everyone uh, at home for all of your, your questions and participation for, uh, you know, really it's been fun to see what everyone would do in the shoes of uh, some of these decision makers. So huge thanks to everyone involved. Uh, here's that contact information to, uh, to enter to win. We look forward to seeing those pictures and seeing everybody back here soon. So thanks everybody. See you. Thank you.